Uh, so in 1951, that's when the United States conducted its very first test in Nevada. And that was on January 27th. That day's become a day of remembrance for downwinders in this country. Anyway, so that's a little background on them conducting the test in Nevada. And I, I asked Matt if he would show a clip from, it's a Google Earth video that actually shows the site. So if you don't mind, before we get into everything else, Matt, why don't you show it? Absolutely. <clears throat> one second, you, you said share the video? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, one moment, everybody. Okay. On that up right now, it's just being a little slow. Today, I'm going to go to Las Vegas, which is right over here. Buddy. Hello. Oh. Is it playing? Today, I'm going to go to Las Vegas. Okay. Yes. Can you can you hear the audio? I can hear it. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Which is right over here. Now near Las Vegas, when you go north and west, sixty-five miles or one hundred four point six kilometers, you end up in this valley right here, which is known as the Nevada Test Site. As you get in closer to it, you can see there's a bunch of craters in the ground hundreds and hundreds of craters and these were made by, from nuclear tests between the years 1951 and 1992 928 nuclear bombs were detonated in this area 100 of those bombs were detonated above ground in this area and 828 of them were detonated underground they were underground nuclear tests as you get in close you can see the area where the underground bombs cave the cave the earth in and it's just all over the place out here there's also some places where you see actual craters like right here and right here as you explore it there's another one right over here and you can see there's a big one right here and inside this circle there's several craters or several underground explosions uh, right next to this big crater but at the same time, this big crater here is not the biggest crater in the, uh, t at the test site. The biggest crater is right over here. And the name of this crater is called Sedan Crater. They made this crater on July 6th, 1962. The device they used was not very big. It was 43 centimeters by 96.5 centimeters and it weighed 212.2 uh, kilograms. That translates to 17 inches by 38 inches, and it weighed 468 pounds. They buried it 635 feet underground, which is 194 meters underground. After it detonated, it left a crater that was 1,280 feet wide by 320 feet deep, or 390 meters wide by 100 meters deep. Eight days after this explosion, they detonated another atomic bomb above ground, and that would have been the last atomic bomb they detonated above ground. But between Sedan Crater and the other bomb they detonated called Small Boy, those two bombs sent enough radiation into the air that floated across the United States and eventually settled right over here. Turn this north a little. It settled pretty much covering the entire state of Iowa and Southern Minnesota. There was also traces of it found on the border of Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio right in here. So it detonated over here and it floated in the atmosphere and then came to settle down in these areas right over here. So kind of gives you an idea of how far nuclear con contamination can travel in the atmosphere. Here is Las Vegas. Now, the interesting thing is this, that back in the 1950s, people would go to Las Vegas and part of the attraction to going to Las Vegas was they would get to see giant mushroom clouds rising up into the sky from the atomic bombs that were detonated over here at the uh, nuclear test site, the Nevada test site. And here's an old mm. photo that was taken from Las Vegas 
looking toward the test site and you can see this giant atomic bomb mushroom cloud rising up into the sky. And this is what you were able to see from Las Vegas back in the 50s. It was a tourist attraction. It was an attraction to Las Vegas. People would go to Vegas just to see these nuclear clouds, just like this. And here's another photo taken from the Nevada test site where you see a bunch of infantry men sitting here in front of a small atomic bomb. They're only six miles away from the blast. And they were, uh, they were most likely doing some type of test to see if the men could handle this type of explosion this close because I believe they were starting to put small nuclear warheads into cannons or, or uh, howitzers and shooting them in at close range. So I believe this was a military test to see what they could do. Of course, this was back in the 50s. Uh, knowing what they know now about nuclear bombs, I really don't think they would ever do this again. Back then, they didn't know as much as they know now. So I'm pretty sure they wouldn't do this today. Now, one of the things that I found interesting about this is that they actually give tours of this area. And I heard that they're free. You can go tour in this area and check it out for yourself. I personally would not want to go there. They say it's safe to go there, but I find it hard to believe that there is not some type of dangerous contamination in a place that has had 928 nuclear bombs detonated. Maybe they're right, but I personally would not be wanting to take that chance. And if you look here at Cedar or a sedan crater, you'll see a little dirt road coming up to it right here. And this is where tourists can actually go and stand on this platform here. In fact, you can see a car right there and a platform right there. It gives you some perspective of how big this crater really is. Well, the tourists can go stand at the edge of this crater and look into it. They say it's safe. They say there's no contamination there, but they also say that the native plants that were in this area before the uh, explosion have never recovered and they don't grow there anymore. My guess is there's probably some type of contamination, but I really don't know. And if you wanted to go check the place out, you could get the tour, but if you tried to go there, you would have to go north up to 95 out of Las Vegas, exit this street here, I believe it's called Mercury Highway. And let's go see what's there down the street view. When you get to this location, you can see there's kind of a checkpoint here where they're not gonna let you in uninvited. You can see here, it says, you are now entering the Nevada National Security Site, no trespassing by order of the United States Department of Energy. So they do give tours, but they just don't let you roam onto this property freely. You have to get permission. I personally wouldn't want to cross this white line because they'll most likely arrest you and maybe even possibly shoot you. I don't know. I wouldn't want to take that chance. In fact, I wouldn't want to go up into this area anywhere close to it because of all the nuclear bombs that have been detonated there. I find it hard to believe that there is not some type of contamination there. But if they say there's not, maybe there isn't. Now, one quick thing before I finish here, I thought it was interesting. I'm going to turn this north. I thought it was interesting as you're getting close to the nuclear bomb test site, you can see here the 928 craters that have been left between 1951 and 1992. Go up to Sedan Crater and then just off to the east, here's Sedan Crater. You have this airport here and this area here is actually the infamous Area 51. This is the place where many people have said they've seen strange looking craft flying out of some people say they are UFOs, but most likely they're probably some type of top secret military device or experimental object that they're flying or testing. So here is Area 51, and right over here is the Nevada test site with the hundreds and hundreds of craters left there from all the nuclear bombs that have been detonated in this little area right here. So there you have it, the Nevada test site or the Nevada nuclear test site near Las Vegas, Nevada, the bird's eye view of it from Google Earth. Okay. 
So a lot of what he says when he says it could be contaminated, they might be right. Um, it definitely is contaminated um, and not safe. Those tests, I mean, 928 of them, I want you to think of that. That is 928 nuclear weapons detonated on U.S. soil. So when you look, look at it, the only victims of atomic weapons in the U.S. are Americans who were bombed by their own government. Um, there have been books called Killing Our Own, and I know that they, the, when you think of where the winds carried that fallout, the winds carried that fallout far from the test site, up to 2,200 miles away. The very first test in 1951 was fogging at Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York. And they discovered that it was from radiation from the Nevada test site. So it went all the way across the country. It um, gets picked up by the jet streams and it gets carried at different levels of the jet streams. It gets carried in different directions. But what happens is when those, um, when it collides with rain or snow, it literally falls out to the ground. That's why it's called fallout. So it contaminates agriculture below. Um, it gets into water, it gets into the food chain. So it is definitely not safe. And there were countless casualties downwind of those tests. A lot of people tend to think, okay, this happened so long ago, but if you look at radiation, some of that has a half-life, as you know, of over a thousand years, um, strontium and cesium that gets sucked up by the bones and teeth and mimics calcium can radiate your body for years and years. It has a half-life of 30 or 40 years. So um, we are still living with the effects of fallout. It's not something that happened in the West and only hurt a group of people living in the West. It's not something that's ancient history. It's something that very much is still affecting people today. And when you look at the genetic damage, it, it's not over. It gets passed on to other generations. So we're looking at a lot of casualties. Uh, you can never guess how many, but uh, one thing we do know is that for whatever guesses there have been, especially if they've been by the government, they are no nowhere near what probably those numbers should be. Um, there's a wonderful book called Atomic Audit where he looks at the cost of nuclear testing and then looks at the human cost. And he predicts that 70,000 to 800,000 people have died from fallout from testing. There was a study just done in 2019 out of the University of Arizona. And he said that there were likely 500,000 deaths that resulted from contaminated agriculture, largely in the Midwest and in the East. So um, we've, we've got numbers, there have been studies. I, I think the reason I do this work is because I'm one of those casualties. I had thyroid cancer. I was only 29 when I was diagnosed. Um, they say that that is most uh, the most susceptible are young children when they're exposed. And I was a young child during that testing. I probably was exposed to at least, I would guess, 700 or more tests um, to fall up from those. Wow. So you're looking at repeated exposure. It's not like you got exposed once to those levels. It was repeated. So that chronic exposure is incredibly dangerous. And there are there are consequences of testing that I, I mean, I'm still seeing people who are being diagnosed who are sick. Um, their cancers come back. They live with health complications the rest of their lives. Um, and it's, it's not only the physical and health damages, but psychologically with every lump, with every sickness, you think that, that it might be coming back. So you never feel like you're clear of a diagnosis. And I know when I had surgery, they removed my thyroid. And the way they treated it then was with radiation. I had to drink what they called a cocktail, um, which was radiation. And I had to be in a high back leaded wheelchair. The nurse wheeled me to my room. There was a caution radioactive material sign on my door and one on my hospital bracelet because I 
was the radioactive material. I, I was not allowed to leave the hospital until the Geiger counter readings were low enough that they said I could be around people wow. again. They would send a doctor every day, open my door and he'd take a reading. They wouldn't even come in to bring food. They left it outside the door. Um, when I did go home, everything I had brought in there with me, including my clothes had to be destroyed. Um, so that, that's pretty shocking. And when I got home, they said, don't be around people for this many days. Don't be around pregnant women or young children for this long and don't try to get pregnant for at least a year. So um, to know that you're the radioactive material is, is pretty alarming. Um, my sister and I, would start, we started counting the number of people in our childhood neighborhood in Salt Lake City who had various cancers and tumors. And, and there were so many. There were little kids when we were young children. I uh, remember when we were eight, our little friend down the street died of a brain tumor. Three weeks later, her four-year-old brother died of testicular cancer. And the cases just kept coming and coming. And over the years, the number of people in our five block area is up to 54 people who got various cancers, autoimmune diseases. We were definitely a cluster. Um, and you know, as kids, we drank milk from a nearby dairy. We ate fresh vegetables from the garden. We played in puddles of rainwater. We put sugar with snow and pretended it was ice cream. All that time, not knowing that a silent poison was threading its way through our bodies. And uh, for a lot of us, it took two decades, maybe more for those symptoms to show up because you don't get sick immediately upon exposure. There's a lag period. Um, I know multiple myeloma can take 40 years to show up. Thyroid cancer that I had can take 15 to 20 or more. So as I said, when when there's that kind of lag period, people just don't put it together. And I think to me, one of the saddest things is that the vast majority of downwinders in America will never know they were. They'll never know what made them sick. Um, I lost my sister when she was 46. She left. Another sister is battling cancer. I've had a cousin who has cancer. My Both my grandparents in Utah died of cancer. Um, it's, it's like here, when we were growing up, we just thought tumors and cancer were a normal part of life, that that happened to everybody. And there was nothing normal about it. So that has inspired me over the years do everything I can. And since I started doing this work, it's been 30 years now. I have heard stories from countless people across this country, just heartbreaking stories. Um, one woman who told me about her husband dying of cancer, then her five-year-old son got bone cancer. And when he woke up from her and said, mama, what happened to my leg? Um, because it was gone. Um, but the stories I hear are just really hard. Um, and as I said, people are still dying. Everyone I worked with on in Utah on this issue for so many years, I'm the only one left. They're all gone. And it's that's pretty hard. It's just pretty hard to see. Um, I, I had one friend who before she died, she said, you have to keep doing this. The rest of us are too sick. And so I feel this immense responsibility to get the word out and to do everything I can to let people know um, when a government knowingly harms its own citizens, that government must be held accountable. And that's one thing we've been working on for years and years because they knew, I'll have people say to me, I'll Oh, maybe. Well, they knew. They knew that it went all the way to Rochester, New York with the very first test. They knew after a 1953 test called Simon that rained out all over Troy, Albany, and Schenectady and was documented. The fallout was documented by research, researchers at Renslauer Polytechnic Institute. So that um, 
we, we know where it went. It went all the way up into Canada. I had a man I interviewed who was an Air Force colonel and his job was to fly planes into the fallout to see how far it went. And he told me himself that he tracked it all the way to Canada, which at the time violated international uh, law, but nobody ever did anything about that. But, um, and he said that when he flew back, they would just hose the plane down with water like that gets rid of fallout. Um, so I've been watching this. I've been working on it. One of my friends who died of three cancers, um, she told me, she said, you know, we're veterans of the Cold War, only no one will ever fold a flag over our coffins and we never enlisted. And that's the thing. All of this was done without telling people. They, I remember um, these little booklets they would make called nuclear testing in Nevada. And they basically told us that we were participants in this wonderful program to keep us safe from the Soviets. And it was interesting because they said people in Colorado, Nevada, Utah, and, and um, elsewhere are saying that they've got Geiger counters and their Geiger counters are going crazy these days. Don't let it bother you. That's what they said. They didn't deny it. They just said, don't let it bother you. Um, there were, there were tests that obviously early on started making a lot of people and animals sick nearby in Southern Utah, which is not far from that test site. And when I was reading it, minutes, which I found fascinating, they read like high drama. Um, there was one of the commissioners said, you know, I, I don't know, people are starting to get sick. Um, animals are dying maybe we shouldn't be testing in the continental US. And the other commissioner just said, nothing. It's going to get in the way of testing, nothing. And again said, this, this means we must handle public information. So that's the way they always looked at it. They um, lied about it. But I, I know to me, I, I just think there's this staggering human cost to all that testing and to the Cold War. We tested more nuclear weapons than any other country, any other country. Um, and I, I've always tried to get this word out. So other people carry pictures of children in their wallets. I carry a map and, and I don't know, can you show that map, Matt? Anyway, it's a map that show, there it is. This shows where fallout went. So you can see where it went. Like my state, Utah is almost completely blacked out. Um, this is a map that Richard Miller, who wrote Under the Clouds, A Decades of Nuclear Fallout, put together based on data from the Atomic Energy Commission, the Defense Nuclear Agency, and the US Weather Service. So this shows where atmospheric testing blew the fallout. Um, anyway, you can go off that map, but when I show that map to people, they're always shocked because I don't know how many of you already knew how far that fallout went, um, but that's, that's where it went. And I, I know that the government finally in 1990, after urgings and urgings, I, I, there, there were um, a group of downwinders who tried to bring a, a lawsuit a class action suit against the government, the Allen et al case. Um, and it was overturned in a federal court saying you can't sue the government. So they were sovereign immunity. So because they couldn't have a legal um, recourse, they sought legislative recourse. And that's why the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was finally introduced and passed in 1990. It was always bipartisan. It was Senator Orange. Hatch of Utah, who was a Republican, and Senator Ted, Ted Kennedy working on, who's a Democrat, working on that together. Uh, George H.W. Bush signed it into law, and it was always presumptive. In other words, if you lived in certain areas during certain years and got certain cancers, it was presumed they were caused by testing. But the geographic area it covered was always extremely limited, and we always fought those boundaries. It was some counties in southern Utah, some counties in southwestern Nevada, and some counties in northern um, Arizona. I think all, in, all together, 22 counties, largely rural counties. And that was because 
if you compensated those entire states, it would involve more populated areas and they knew they wouldn't be able to get that passed in Congress. So those were not the original intentions of that act for, for it to be so narrow. But we've been working for probably, well, since 1990, what is that, almost 30 years now, 32, to get that bill expanded to cover more states, to um, include the Trinity victims. Trinity victims were never covered under RECA. Uh, and, and there were casualties there. So a lot of people I work with are from New Mexico and they will tell those stories. So we have um, been lucky enough to have Senator Crapo Mike Crapo of Idaho, he's a Republican, working with Senator Bill Ray Lujan of New Mexico, who's a Democrat. They introduced a bill into the Senate um, to expand the current act, because I, I have to tell you that so many of the people who were affected are dead. And they're dying. And so we feel like time is literally running out. Um, so there's a companion bill in the House that's um, 5338, and the Senate bill is 2798. Those bills right now, are ga they've gained momentum. We have 68 co-sponsors in the House from all around the country. We have 18 co-sponsors in the Senate, and the bill has made it past the House Judiciary Committee, it sailed right through. Um, there's a little worry about it getting through the Senate Judiciary Committee because you have to have 60 votes and you know how close the Senate is right now. So we need more Republicans um, to be candid. We need more Republicans to sign on to that bill. Um, what happened in the meantime is there's been an extension that the House and Senate approved is kind of a stopgap measure. It expands the current bill for two years. Um, which is not what anybody really wanted, but they figured it was set to expire next month. So without congressional action, it, it would have just died and nobody would have ever seen comp, um, compensation again. Um, and I have to say the compensation, $50,000, which covers not even your chemo. Um, the new bill is gonna raise that to 150,000. Uh, it's also going to include health care, uh, which people who worked uh, as workers at, at the test site um, already have, uh, but we, the unwitting of victims didn't get that. So, it, I mean, to me, it's a huge matter of social justice. It's the right thing to do. I, I just can't say that enough. I know we have um, some people in Nebraska helping us on this bill and they, the guy said, he said, you know where I come from, if you break it, you fix it. And he said, and there are a lot of broken people with broken lives because of what the government did. We need to do right by them. Um, over, I, I should probably let you know, sometimes people say, well, it's gonna cost too much. Um, well, first I tell them, well, what's a human life worth? What, what's my life worth? $50,000? Um, anyway, I, I think that that's the wrong way to look at it because if you look at what we spend just to maintain our nuclear weapons in this country, $50 billion a year, a year, okay. Over the last 32 years, RECA has paid out $2.5 billion to 39,000 claimants, which is as one of the gentlemen um, in Congress from Tennessee said, he said, that's a pittance, that is a pittance. So we have been working hard to get these bills passed and I'm thrilled that you're even interested in this. There's so much going on in the world. It's really hard to get traction because it's, it's kind of like the US I think is one constant house fire you're trying to put out. Um, and we're, we're, we do have some traction but I think there's a, a lot still to be done. I as we talk, we've been meeting via Zoom for the last two years with senators and congressmen from around the country and their staffs. And one thing that becomes very clear to me is that most people don't even know the history 
of, of nuclear testing and what it did in this country. Um, and that to me is incredibly sad because we, people need to know their own history. We need to know what happened because so many people were affected by it. I, I'm always saying to people, we're all downwinders. We all live downwind. Um, so you can't just ignore it. And I, I mean, it's my most fervid, fervid dream that we get these bills through, that we do right by people before everyone dies. We used to all, I'd hear people all the time say, they're just waiting for us to all die. They're just waiting. Um, and, and I talked to one attorney, this was interesting, who said, you know, if I was doing a civil case against a company that had this many lives had been lost because of them, he said, I could probably get 500 million per person. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but, but he said, it's, it's really, I think, just tragic. What, what's happened to so many people as a result of our yep. nuclear weapons testing. It's, to me, it's devastatingly tragic. Um, so I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. Um, there's somebody in the chat saying, what can we do specifically? Well, Matt has for you, um, if you're in New York, he has a list of your congressional reps um, who have not signed on to the bill. You can write to them and ask them to become co-sponsors of the, of the House bill. You can write to Senator Chuck Schumer. This would be incredibly helpful. And ask him to become a co-sponsor of the bill in the Senate. Um, some of your representatives have already signed on. You can reach out to them and ask them um, or thank them um, and ask them to help bring other congressional representatives on board. I think also you can, I'm looking at these questions. I've got all sorts of background material that you can send to them. We've got a fact sheet that, that we've been working now with a lot of groups nationally, the Union of Concerned Scientists, Physicians for Social Responsibility and other national groups on all of this. And they've been, it's been incredibly helpful because I'll tell you when you're working on this yourself, it, it gets to be really overwhelming and really tough. Um, we meet bi-weekly uh, to, to come up with new strategies, to update everyone on what's happening. I work with a group of front, from the frontline community in Western states and Guam, as well as uranium miners, because that's also part of the bill, um, is uranium miners. Uh, and that we meet weekly. And it's, it's been incredibly helpful to meet with people, to have other people, to feel like you're not alone in this work because it can get pretty lonely. And I have to say, incredibly discouraging. Um, sometimes we feel like all our victories are temporary. And I think right now, this is the closest we will ever be to getting justice. It's the closest. If we don't get it now, it, it's just not gonna happen. Um, so, I, I do have materials for anyone who wants them. Matt, did I send you that background sheet? Matt has the background sheet. Okay. Yes. The, the one pager? Uh, yeah, the one pager. Yeah. I, I'm sending the link. He has, he has that sheet. Um, but it would also help not just somebody asked about other representatives. You know, if you wanted to reach out to members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, that would be incredibly helpful because that's where the Senate bill will go next. And again, until we feel like we have enough Republicans on that committee to get it through, we are hesitant to try to get that even introduced into that committee. So we need, we, we do need some more Republican senators to join their other colleagues and become co-sponsors. Um, and, and even if, and one thing we decided just today when we were talking, um, is that even if they don't feel comfortable becoming a co-sponsor, ask if they we can have their support when the vote comes up. That also would make a huge difference because that would at least give us an idea of what kind of support we could count on. I'm looking at all these other things, all of these. Okay, great. Oh, Matt, thank you, thank you. Anyway, I would just love to open it to questions. Um, anything else you want to know uh, would be helpful. There's there's a hand raised. Hi, can you hear me? 
Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Jake is my name. Calling from Chicago. Oh, hi, um, Jake. Yeah. All right. What, what's your name? I didn't catch the beginning. It's Mary Dixon. Okay. And you and you live in St. Lo- um, you're, you're in, in Salt Lake I'm City? I'm in Salt Lake City, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm in Chicago. Who's the chair of the Judiciary Committee in the South? Well, it's your own senator, Dick Durbin, who's been very helpful. Okay, that's yeah, that's we've, met, that's good. we've met with them. He's been incredibly helpful. He's trying to help us right. figure out what to do next. But right. you've got okay. a good guy. You might write and thank him. Yeah. Okay. I'll, 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 I've known him for years. Yeah, I'll call his office. And, and thank great, him for, great. Um, yeah, but, um, uh, okay. Um, now you mentioned um, um, how many, um, how many uh, atomic, you, you are familiar with the atomic veterans? Yes, yes. We knew we knew an atomic veteran, Jim Gates was his name. He died many years ago of a heart attack. He was discovered by a friend of mine. I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but anyway, they hooked up together. He went and visited him in the hospital. He wanted someone to talk to, and he was having some kind of surgery or something. Um, it turned out that what happened, he was... He was uh, 16 years old. He dropped. He was an African American, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he was 16 years old. Dropped out of high school. Went into the military. They sent him to Korea. He survived the Korean War with flying colors. He came back. They sent him to Camp Desert Rock in Nevada, mm-hmm. where he witnessed one of the one of the early nuclear weapons tests. He claims to have seen the bones through his fingers. Oh, no, they did. They saw many of them. Yeah, right, 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 that. right. So anyway, then he he then when he came back here, he drive he drove a cab for many years, and then he he until he um he kept working until he was no longer strong enough to be able to lift the bags out of the trunk of the cab. And then he applied for disability benefits, and they gave him every conceivable excuse to deny him his benefits. Wow. The doctor diagnosed him with polymyositis, which is general muscle illness, which they claim well, is from the radiation yeah, exposure. My friends who died had that in addition right, to cancer. Right, yeah. right. And then um, part of his problem was part of his problem was that there was a fire at this fire at this. Um, uh, military service office, and so his 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 military records were destroyed, and so he had a hard time even placing himself there. Yeah, yeah. And and so that's why when he talked about seeing bones through his fingers, they thought he was crazy. No, no, many of them reported that it was. Yeah, I know, I know. But I'm saying they said, wait a minute, you you seeing bones through your you through your fingers? Yeah. Are you for real? They didn't believe him. Finally, he finally after he well, after one or two years, he got some attorneys. He had one of the peace groups, American Friends Service Committee, gave him a sleeping bag space in their office, and friends gave him food. And he went. It took him like a year or longer. I think it was three, two or three years, maybe. He went in and out of court, and finally he was able to get some compensation, and he got himself an apartment. And a few years later, he died of a heart attack. But mm-hmm. he was. He was like 69 years old when he died. He was glad to win this case because it set a, a good precedent. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I know atomic veterans can be compensated. Uh, the thing right. that they did, they literally made those men giddy pigs. They sent them out to the test site in the trenches to watch tests because they wanted to see if soldiers could still fight after someone had dropped an atomic bomb. Um, so they were they were guinea pigs, and it was the mothers of a lot of those men who finally got a congressional hearing. And I, I've got the whole um, the transcripts of all of that in a book here. Um, it was the mothers who said, "You know, my son got sick because of you. He died because yep. of you." There were a lot of casualties. Yep. I mean, yep. I mean, who poisons their own servicemen? You know. Yep. 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 Yeah. I, I know Harvey Wasserman. I know that I know that book that you mentioned. So yeah. apparently, it's out of print now. I wish it would come back into print. But I know, I know, a lot of it is. You know, another book I should let people know about Richard Miller's book, "Under the Cloud: The Decades of Nuclear Testing," is is also a great book to read. Yeah. Under the cloud. Okay. Um, yeah. To give us the the um, the bill numbers again. 
The bill numbers, the Senate bill is 2798. The House two, bill. Seven. 2798. Okay. And the House bill is HR 5338. 5338. And who's the sponsor in the House? The sponsor in the House is Representative Teresa Ledger Fernandez of New Mexico. She's a Democrat. And Representative Burgess Owens, a Republican from Utah. Okay. Don't know why but in the Senate, who are the sponsors? The sponsors are Senator Mike Crapo of Idaho, Republican, and Senator Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico, who's a Democrat. And interestingly, okay. enough, both yeah. Senator Crapo, Senator Lujan, and Representative Fernandez Ledger, they are all, they have downwind stories. Some of them are downwinders, so. Yeah. I'd always say nothing makes you an activist faster than a diagnosis, yeah. Yep. I also knew. I also knew one of the uh, one of the uh, Manhattan Project scientists. Leo Saren was his name. He passed oh, wow. passed away about twenty twenty five years ago. He witnessed a uh, witnessed a um, uh, what's it called criticality accident in in, in in the laboratory. It was written up. It's written up in all the journals. Um, Meriwether was his name. He was juggling around these two little pellets of uranium in his hands. <laughs> Leo said to him, don't, don't mess around with it because you're playing with fire. He walked out of the room and looked back through the little glass panel that was separating the two rooms. And what he, afraid, what he was afraid might happen did happen. These two little pellets of uranium touched together. Blue haze filled up the room. Uh, and with, within, within the next 10 days, his friend died of, of radiation sickness. Sure, sure. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is from just two little pellets of uranium. Um, yeah. it, it had a, yeah. it, it had, a la had a lasting effect on him. Oh, yeah. I mean, when when I look at it, because I I just kind of focus on victims um, of nuclear testing, but yep. when you look at that whole nuclear cycle, I mean, from the production to the development to the testing to the then, what do you do with the waste? All along the way, are casualties. There are so many victims from those tests that. Uh, it just gets really discouraging to me to even look at it. Um, it gets really depressing really fast. I mean, I know people who live in Hanford um, because of the Hanford plant there. Uh, people who worked in Tennessee, Oak Ridge, um, just farm, I mean, um, a lot of miners who are Native Americans because a lot of those mines are on tribal lands. Uh, and here are these people who even for them to get compensation, if they are eligible, yep. they can't prove where they were born. They don't have the, they don't have medical records. They didn't go to traditional doctors. They can't prove the disease. Yeah. They had. Right. Um, so yeah. they're left with proof. no recourse, you know. And they're still getting yep. sick from the uranium mines that are open down there. Um, and and there are mines all across the country. I've got a map somewhere of them. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and that those open mines. Those tailings will get into the water. They found all sorts of things in the water on some of the reservations from the mines that have not been handled. They're, they're just left open. Kids play near them. Um, it's pretty yeah. awful. Yeah. So that's we, we, we had a problem. We had a problem up here in West Chicago. This is years ago. There, there were like 36 tons of radioactive thorium tailings. Um, mm. They were just they were just piled piled up there in a in a, re, in a residential area in West Chicago. Oh, kids were playing in them. Yeah, it, kids exactly. were playing. Yeah, I mean it's it's really kind of beyond the pale to me how irresponsible yeah. government and industry have been with yeah. all this nuclear. Yeah, and, sure, it took over took over ten years worth of lawsuits in order to get the problem cleared up. 10 years, she, and by then look how many people probably got sick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of the victims have ever been compensated for that one. I, it, 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 I doubt it. Outrageous. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think so, I don't think so. Yeah. So what is the name of this bill? It's called the Radiation Exposure Compensation 
Act amendments of 2019 or 2021. Oh, 2021. Act I know it's a long name. Yeah. Amendment of 2020, 2020, 2022. 2021, because they introduced it last last okay. fall. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. And when do you when do you meet? When does your group meet? We meet um, the group of the national allies and NGOs. We meet every other Tuesday, and then I meet with okay. the frontline community every Thursday. Okay. Is this these in-person meetings or is or They're all like Zoom. This? The last two years, everything's been Zoom. Every meeting we've had with oh, um, cool. senators, every meeting we've had, every speak speech we've given has been on Zoom. Okay, so it's every other Tuesday. What time? Yeah. Uh, we meet at three o'clock. Well, we meet at two o'clock and with the national groups and then the frontline community, largely in the West, we meet at three on Thursdays. Oh, okay, so yeah. two o'clock. Somebody else two o'clock. Yeah. What, what time zone I'm talking about? That's mountain time. Oh, so it'll be later, it'll be three o'clock. Yeah. Okay. okay, and and can I move to Megan? Megan's had her hand up here. Okay, Hi. Just, want, Hi, just want your, okay. Just want your, your, your content. Oh. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. Wait, go ahead. What was your last thing? What you said? Okay, I'm gonna um, put my contact information on here. And I think I think he's on telephone, possibly, so you might need to just hear. Ah, it. Yeah, yeah, I'm on phone. I'm on oh, phone. you're on phone. On okay, phone. okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Mary, it's Mary Dixon, and I am at. Hold on, hold on a second. Let me yeah, okay. Wait a minute. Mary Dixon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my email is miss, M I S S Mary S L C, like Salt Lake City, at Gmail. Wait, say it once again. Miss Mary S L C at Gmail. S Wait, Miss, spell yeah, it out. I S S. M S S. No, M I, like Miss. M I S S. M I S S. Mary. Yeah. Mary. S. Like Sam, L like Lake, C like City, at S gmail com. S C L. Yeah, that's for Salt Lake City. Oh, S L C. Uh huh. At gmail com. Yeah. At gmail com. Okay. All right. That's good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, Megan. Hi, Mary. Thanks for all this information. There's. Sounds like there's different teammates working in different places. And I wondered if you could talk about the different groups and how people work together. Oh, oh, sure. Okay. Um, our group, um, the frontline community, we have a woman from New Mexico and she lives in Albuquerque. She has the Tularosa Basin. Oh yeah. Downers. We've met her. She's there. You know, Tina. Yeah, Tina's incredible. So yeah, we've worked together a lot and been on a lot of Zoom calls together. Um, anyway, they, they've they been incredibly helpful and productive. We have a group out of Idaho called the Idaho Downwinders, um, Guam, Pacific, uh, let's see, but I've got, I have to like P-A-R-S, Pacific Association of Radiation Survivors. Um, and yeah, and then we work with Phil Harrison, who is part of the Navajo Nation uranium miner, um, a man named Garrett Vallow, who's also um, a Native American miner from another tribe, and a woman named Loretta Anderson, um, who works with them. So we meet. Uh, we have a woman also in Colorado who is a downwinder. Um, like that woman, I work essentially on my own because everybody I worked with on this issue in Utah, as I said, they've all died, so it's me. Um, so it's just been a godsend to have to hook up with these people, and especially to hook up with the national group because we've got Beyond the Bomb folks, we've got Union of Concerned Scientists, um, and it's a, a woman who handles outreach there, who actually calls our meetings together, and it's an amazing resource and moderator. Um, so physicians with social responsibility, others, 
they have, it's been so helpful to have these people, people from atomic veteran groups, uh, from atomic cleanup veteran groups. And so I, I, it's so great to see so many people working together on this and every one of them has a story to tell essentially. And that's, I think, you know, one thing I've discovered in this work, it doesn't matter how many facts and figures and all the data in the world we can give to senators or congressmen. The thing that always gets them are the stories. It's the stories. That's what gets them. And that's what got Burgess Owens, our representative, who's a co-sponsor of the bill, um, because he's not from Utah. So he didn't know that history, really. It was when we called him and I was telling my story, he, he was wiping tears away. And he said, we've got to do the right thing. We've got to do the right thing. And he's, you know, we cannot get either of the senators here in Utah, Mitt Romney, nor Mike Lee, to become co-sponsors of this bill, which greatly pains me, I have to say, because they know what it did to the people of Utah. I mean, right now, only people in southern Utah are compensated. Up in northern Utah, where it was more populated, we're not. And that's, you know, where I am. But... Um, so here's Burgess Owens, who goes out on a limb and says, I'm making this one of my issues. And he's brought on a lot of other Republican Congress people. I wish he could talk sense into Mike Lee, who's on the Judiciary Committee, and Mitt Romney. I wish he could like get them to co-sponsor. Hey, why, why won't they support it? Well, you know, Mike Lee... You know, it's, oh, it's going to cost too much money. And where's your pr proof? Where's your proof? We have to have scientific data. Well, you know, there is data. The National Cancer Institute did a study in 97. Uh, it yeah. took years for that study to be released. But it yeah. basically only thyroid cancer and iodine-131. But they concluded that every county in the continental U.S. got some level of fallout from testing and said that up to 212,000 cases of thyroid cancer alone were likely caused by fallout. Um, and, and that study, pages, and I mean, it's like, I can't remember, 100,000 pages or more. Um, and, you know, we can get, we gave like all this information uh, to Mike Lee's office. I actually went through an, a Richard Miller's Atlas of Nuclear Fallout for each test and how much each county got to show them why these states should be added. And, and he said, well, no, no, because we talked to somebody um, about this study that, that would shows us why Utah should be added, but not the rest of them. And I, I had to say to this guy, it's the same study I'm talking to you about. It's the same study. Um, yeah. And then you know, they'll say, oh, it's going to cost too much. Um, and which to me is very specious. Um, I don't think, I don't really give validity to that claim. I mean, what is it? The Pentagon budget cannot account for 10% of where their money went yeah. in audits. They can't, there's 10% of that Pentagon budget that they can't account for. So, you know, it's yeah. not the money. It's just a matter of yeah. priority and, and will. It, 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 it'll, it'll cost, it'll cost too much because it, it, puts the whole nuclear weapons program on trial. That's exactly, right. <laughs> exactly, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Matt, you've got your hand up. I do, yes. I want to draw attention real quick to a question we have in chat from Michaela. Um, and Michaela asked, is there by chance an action tool for this online already? Uh, one that helps you send yes. a message right yes. to the endless um, it's a group called WAND, and they do have that. I'll get that to, I don't know, Michaela, should I just send it to you or should I give it to you, Matt, and you give it to people? Um, if you if you could send that to, to me and to Michaela, that'd be perfect. And I'll okay. make sure that everyone gets that as well. Okay, great, great. Yeah, Michaela, WAND, um, it's Women Advancing New Directions. I think that's what it stands for. But they're part of our group, too, that meets regularly, and they've been amazing with action alerts and things. So I can get that to you. And then, yeah, it can go right to your representatives. So, yeah. I had one other question as well. Um, sure. you, you mentioned, I mean, just like the very nature of, of like this nuclear fallout, it just goes everywhere. 
has oh, it yeah. has it ever been like an international like issue like has like you mentioned oh, yeah. Canada like oh yeah well you know there is a French researcher who studied where fallout from French testing went and he's now looking at studying that in America wow. so um, yeah like and and when you think about it too we weren't the only people conducting nuclear weapons so there there's been one estimate and it's just so mind-boggling I can't even wrap my head around the number like how many billion microcuries of radiation are in the atmosphere from worldwide testing so when you look at the really the casualties of these weapons and this arms race around the world it's devastating it's just devastating I mean the Russians were less careful than we were um, and oh, imagine yeah. trying to get information real information about uh everything from Russia or China, you're not going to get it. I mean, even here, um, even when documents were declassified, they're still redacted. They're big black marks short sections. Oh. Yeah, after after Chernobyl happened, the doctors yeah. were ordered. The doctors were ordered if somebody comes to, comes to you with symptoms of radiation sick, uh, sickness, you're you're not to diagnose it. So uh, they gave it a uh, they gave it a funny euphemism. They gave it a funny euphemism, sleeping oh, wow. sickness or something. A lot of doctors who refused to go along with that. Yeah. But th that's that's how far they tried to cover up the Chernobyl accident. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yep. I'll tell you, there were a lot of lives sacrificed in that Cold War. A lot. Yeah. And now, how do you get that nuclear genie back in the bottle? It's, I'm going yeah. in, um, on June 16th, I'm going to the ICANN conference in Vienna, uh, which they're the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And I, I just don't know. And, and now, you know, I mean, here we are on the brink of a new Cold War with Russia because they're yep. talking... Yep. Putin was talking about yep. using nuclear weapons and, you know, doing the yep. nuclear saber rattling. So yep. I think the bulletin of atomic scientists said we're now 30 seconds from midnight. It's, yep. it's, we live in dangerous, crazy times. Yep. Really do. Yep. yep. Horrible. Yep. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah, I mean, that they're talking about even smaller tactical nuclear weapons. Do you remember after 9-11, I don't know if you all remember, when they were trying to resume nuclear testing in Nevada? Um, and we were all going crazy, of course, because they thought that these bunker buster nuclear weapons would be the way to fight terrorism. It's like, really? And how would those have helped us with the airplanes yeah. to the World Trade Center? Yeah. It was just all such madness to me. There is actually a nuclear testing museum, the Atomic Testing Museum in Nevada off the Strip. I went there when I was there for other meetings and went through and was madly scribbling notes and um, asked to meet with the director because they don't mention the human um, casualties at all. Even when they do talk about Nagasaki and Hiroshima, they don't talk about how many people were killed there. They don't talk about how many Americans were harmed from nuclear testing, from our own nuclear testing. They have this little simulated auditor or, or amphitheater where you sit and they say, you know, you're gonna feel your chair rock like during a nuclear blast. And then you hear the big boom. And it just made me laugh. It was so utterly ridiculous. And you go in the gift shop there and they are selling recipe, little. Um, cocktail or little shot glasses, you know, that come with the recipe for an atomic cocktail guarantee to give you a blast. I mean, they sell t-shirts with different pictures of tests on them. It's, it, it gave me a huge headache to be there because it's all, all funded who's, by who's, 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 yeah, who's running this thing. Yeah, it's funded by the test site and the defense industry. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's maddening. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, Nevada is a gambling state. What do you expect? Yeah. Yeah. They took a big gamble. Yeah. Anyway, um, more questions? Any other questions? All 
All right, that might be it for questions. Yeah, I get. I got another okay. question. What what happens What happens when you're trying to file a claim for someone, and they say, "Where's your proof?" What, what I mean, what what's the threshold well, I'll, of proof? I'll, I'll I'll tell you. Um, because what you have to prove is that you lived in one of the approved areas between nineteen. 51 yeah. and 1958 or the summer of 62 although that it's just the summer's kind of ridiculous when there were 96 tests conducted in all of 1962 so you have to prove that you lived there um okay imagine if you were a small child then where's your proof you know um yeah. you have to have lived in one of the acceptable areas and you have to show medical records that you suffered from one of 18 kinds of cancer or leukemia. Yeah. Uh, and you know, that's really hard for some people to do. It's, it's hard to yeah. gather the materials. There are these you can hire to help you, but they take like 2% right. of what you get. Right. So it's hard. And, and if you're, like I said, if, if you're a Native American on tribal lands, it's really hard because yeah. you, don't, you just don't have those things. Right. Part of what, right. you know, one representative asked us when we talked is like, how, how are you going to make it easier for people to prove that they lived in these areas or they had these cancers and, and how are you going to get the word out? That's the other one somebody asked us that I thought was an incredibly good question um, because I've actually gone to St. George, Utah, which was a really hot zone and people there can yep. be compensated. There was a man who in his seventies, I was talking to and his wife had just died of cancer. He had cancer. And I said, well, you know, were you here during these years? Yeah, yeah, I was. I said, well, you can be compensated. And he goes, well, nobody sent me a letter. And, you know, that's the thing, the outreach to let people know about compensation. It's not like they poured any money into doing that. So people, most people who are even eligible for compensation now don't realize they are. Um, and so we have somebody ask us, what are you going to do if it gets expanded? How are you going to get that word out to people? I thought, well, it's a really, that's a good question. I, I did have an attorney call me and who's really interested in getting involved in all this. And, and she said, we've just got to, you know, find ways to get the word out. Um, yep. And we do, we do. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay. Um, so you're... Know, one of the worries I've always had is I think the reason people think that fallout only affected this little circle, um, yeah. because whenever I tell people I'm a downwinder, I didn't know you grew up in Southern Utah. It's like, no, 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 Northern Utah. Um, but because that's the area that's compensated. So people have this idea that those are the only people who were harmed. One of my worries, frankly, is that we're adding these other states but that's just in the West. Yeah, they got more fallout than a lot of places. But then people will think, oh, it was just those Western states. When, as I told you, the Midwest and the East Coast got it too. So that's kind of, that gives me qualms kind of, because it's not just those states we're adding that were affected. Um, there are places in Illinois that got it pretty heavy. Uh, Boston got Nuke, I mean, they got that fallout heavily at one point. I mean, it, it just went it, everywhere. So it, if you try to add it, every state that was affected, you'd end up having to add a whole lot of people. And which is, I think, one reason even we are saying, well, let's get these West, Western states covered. Yeah. Um, they, found, I, they, found radio, they found radioactive fallout even in, in the Antarctic. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, you know, that's what I always tell people. You never know where the wind's going to blow. There was one test in 1958 when they were conducting as many as they could before the test ban treaty was going to go in the atmospheric test ban treaty. Um, and they weren't that careful, but there was one and the wind suddenly shifted and blew it toward LA. And John Goffman, who was with the Manhattan Project, who was there, he, and there's an article in the paper there. He said some people likely would die of cancer from the fallout that got trapped in an inversion cloud in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. You know what, 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 year, if, if, what, what year was that? That was 1958. You know which date? Yeah. Oh, I have the newspaper article in here somewhere. Um, I don't know how fast I could get it. Yep. I, I yep. could find it, though. You, you know who else died of cancer from a nuclear test? Who? John Wayne, the all American. Oh, I knew boy. you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. Okay, John <laughs> Wayne made the cheesiest movie called The Conqueror, where he was supposed to be Genghis Khan, but he still sounded like John Wayne. And yeah. Susan Hayward was in it. She was supposed to be this like princess, you know. It was so ridiculous and awful. You know, it was just a terrible movie. You should watch it just to laugh. But it was filmed in a canyon outside St. George, Utah, during yep, one of the yep. dirtiest tests called Dirty Harry in 1953. And over half of that cast and crew died. They got cancer yep. and died from that test. Yep. And People Magazine yep. did a big story on this. I have a copy of it. And one of the questions that one of the scientists from the test site Oh my God, he said, I hope we didn't kill John Wayne. And <laughs> we always we always said nobody cared until John Wayne and that the cast and crew of that movie got sick. That's what got this public attention. It took them getting sick and dying for anybody to care. Because when it was just the people <laughs> here, didn't matter. But oh, yeah. oh yeah. And another thing they did, they actually took some of the sand from there and shipped it back to the lots in LA to finish filming and had these big fans that would blow it around. And yeah, yep. so that hot sand went right back to Hollywood. Anyway, there's, there's well, a filmmaker now, cause I went, I was, he interviewed, I was interviewed by him, but he's making a movie mostly about John Wayne and that, and that movie. And then he interviews John Wayne's kids who would go play in the, you know, radiated sand he interviews susan hayward's survivors um anyway it's he's pulled up some pretty interesting stuff what's but the name know, of the movie it's called the conqueror oh yeah oh it's oh, a documentary about john wayne okay yeah they're making a doc oh oh it's a doc no the conqueror is the movie that john wayne made that's really bad i don't know right. what i can't remember right. the name of the movie the filmmaker's now making i don't remember it but yeah, you should watch it just for laughs. At one point, he grabs Susan Hayward. He goes, come here, Tiger woman. <laughs> it's terrible acting. It's all bad. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you know what's interesting? Right. You know, Howard Hughes was very anti-testing. Very anti-testing. Oh. And at one point, he Whoa. offered to pay the government to move it out of, out of the U.S. Yeah. He didn't like, he said, his chandeliers and penthouse swinging. Anyway, there are a lot of just interesting little facts around all this. So I got your contact information. It's yeah. called Miss, Miss Mary SRG. Is that right? No, SLC. Like SLC. Okay. Salt Lake City. Yeah. SLC. Oh, Salt Lake City. Yeah gmail.com okay what's the name of your organization well i'm actually i don't have an organization because i'm i'm a writer okay. and um but they're I, yeah i don't i'm sorry I'm, Oh, okay. I used to well, okay. 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 But the, 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 the national group meets every other Tuesday yeah. at, at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. at, that's that's Eastern. That's Western time. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be three o'clock oh, Chicago three time. Three Chicago time. Yeah. Yeah. And how do I get into the meetings? You know what? You just send me yeah. an email and I'll send it to the woman who runs them. Oh, well, let me give you my email address. okay let me grab a pen or actually let me just i'll just type it into right. a document here okay give me your name and your email okay okay my name is jake aronov a-r-o-n-o-v a-r okay wait i'm trying to get this document to move so i can put it in here oh save save okay Okay. Uh, oh, shoot. I just lost that page. Wait. Sorry. 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 
Okay. All right. Give wow. it to me again. Jake. Okay. Jake. J A K E Aronov. A R O N O V. Okay. And it's T O N E Z A P. E Z at yahoo.com. Yahoo.com. Okay. T O N E Z A N P. No. Start over again. T O N E Z A P. Z A P. Got it. Yeah, okay. yahoo.com. Got it. Okay. I, I have a computer here. I have a friend who's taking the emails for me. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. That's what that, that's his email. All right. Thanks, Jake. So, yeah. And just let me know about the meeting. So I'll try to try okay. to attend. And okay. I, I need a, I need a contact for a uh, telephone contact. I don't have a computer okay. here. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. So we're about four minutes from 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Thank you so much, Mary, for this. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing thank you. presentation. Uh, very quickly, I'm just going to send, and that's what I'm going to send everything out in an email, just a follow-up email with all the resources, all the action tools. I am sending a template for a write your representative, write your senator, um, and I'll make sure everyone gets um, access to that so they can use that as a template. But again, thank you so much, Mary. Like I, oh, I, I learned so much and feel so much more existential dread, but thank you so, so much. <laughs> I'm sorry for increasing your existential dread. Oh, you're <laughs> fine. My life, existential dread. No, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. It, and it's really, um, I mean, just you're talking about just how like intersectional, how global like this issue. Yeah nuclear fallout is like it's really um it's it's just so many people just feel like oh nuclear weapons are it's, it's whatever but it's it's really it affects everybody 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 yep. yeah oh yeah i mean globally it's yeah yep. Yep. okay absolutely absolutely um thank you thank you again matt thank you thanks everybody for sticking with it. thank you thank okay. you so much more. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a great rest of your night. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank you. Bye.